right, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, this lecture represents the culmination of some, uh, some ideas and um, an interest that I've really held dear to my heart my whole life. So I, I've been playing the organ since I was young, and I've always been interested in uh, the materials of soil and geology, and it was kind of amazing once I realized how powerful the interactions um, the crossover between these two worlds was. So um, with that, I'll begin. All right, so, um, so we're going to be looking at the mineralogy of pipe organs, um, but I, I don't want to be too reductive here. Sometimes when we talk about merging uh, science and art, we tend to force it. <laughs> so for example, when I tell people that I am a geologist and an organist, everyone mentions this one organ in Virginia <laughs> that lives in a cave, <laughs> and it plays um, the stalactites around it that are different thicknesses, but it's not even an organ. It's actually, um, it's not a vibraphone, but it's, it's something like that, where it's actually just exploring the resonance of, of these, um, these actually uh, solid, um, solid minerals of stalactites. So I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to give um, some background on the pipe organ. Uh, for, for a lot of people, um, this is kind of a, an, an interesting instrument to meet because it has 2,000 years of history. And so I think it's really useful to dig into that history. And we can do that um, for weeks and months. I'm going to try and make it 10 minutes. Um, then I'm going to delve into some of the material science and um, keyboard stories that I've learned, um, the ways in which science can actually inform the story of the organ, where it's been, where it's headed, and actually help save some organs in Europe. After that, um, I'm going to flip it around, and we can look at how, um, how looking at organs and, and music can actually inform our science and, and help us better understand complex systems. So if you'll excuse me, I have this super fancy slide technology that uses my phone to advance the slides. So I'm not texting. I'm actually just scrolling through. <laughs> All right, obviously it failed. <laughs> so the organ, um, the organ story really begins um, in the 3rd century BC, if you can call this an organ, I think you can, uh, with the hydrolis, which is basically the Romans' attempt to create a, a mechanical panpipes. So they're like, we love the panpipes. Can we, can we actually um, automate the, or get this machinized by, um, by pumping water um, into a chamber that uh, regulates the wind pressure and then forces air into these pipes. So this is really exciting when it came out. Then the Roman Empire fell, and uh, <laughs> we almost lost the organ. It did. It did have a keyboard. 2,000 years later, we've suddenly got um, organs with seven keyboards, 30,000 pipes, and 64-foot-tall pipes at that. Um, so we've come quite a long way. How did we get there? <laughs> All these organs have four things in common. They have wind, they have pipes, they have keys, and they have a player. You need the, these things to make, um, make an organ work. And we're going to look at um, some of the materials those are made out of uh, to help tell this story. After the hydrolis, the next development in the organ um, came around uh, the 13th century with the development of the organ, organetto. So, um, this is an instrument that is pumped by hand, and suddenly we've eliminated the watery beginning. We can use um, a bellows to, to actually force air through the pipes, and it's got a really charming sound. It also requires a cape to play. <laughs> oh, is it not moving for you? It looks pretty awesome on my screen. <laughs> All right. After the organetto, um, we start. The organ starts expanding at a <clears throat> at a pretty significant rate. Suddenly, instead of pumping it with our with our hand, um, we can actually 
uh, use someone else to pump the organ and pay them in wine, in fact. Um, <laughs> and we can add uh, more keyboards and more pipes. So, so the, the really cool feature of the organ, when you hear someone say, I'm going to pull out all the stops, <clears throat> they're talking about um, a concept that's related to the organ. So you've got uh, sets of pipes that are controlled by these, um, these, these sort of pull knobs. Um, so, so in Germany and France and Italy and Spain, we see these organs becoming bigger and more complex, and suddenly you cannot just play with your, your hands, but you're also playing with your feet. So it's quite an acrobatic um, movement. And when that happens, um, composers actually start to go pretty wild with it. So um, Arnold Schlick actually did a really cool... Um, so, so he sees the capabilities of this organ, right? And he goes, all right, people used to play like one and two voices or one and two notes at the same time on the organ, maybe three or four. I can take this further. I can make 10, 10 voice counterpoint and people are gonna play this on this instrument. So um, I'm gonna play a little example of that. So <laughs> we've got... We've got 10 voices played, independent voices played at a single time by this person. She's using both her heel and her toe. She's wearing like, like high heels to do this <laughs> and playing six, six voices with her hands. This is a pretty awesome thing to do at an instrument. <laughs> And this is part of why the organ was so popular in Europe, right? This is the most complicated machine before the Industrial Revolution in many senses. Um, so it's, it's really, um, it becomes kind of the pinnacle of music at the time. Um, composers are using it to be really creative. We have, we have organists representing uh, sort of uh, the, the most advanced musicians of their time. They're improvisers, they're composers, they're conductors, and they're organists. Um, <laughs> however, with... Um, with the growth of the organ, it, it also becomes really attached to, um, to the sense of place, right? So, so you have organs really um, being married to the acoustical environment in which they're situated. So um, with that, organs start to be connected to religious movements, and they become controversial. So with Calvinism and the Counter-Reformation, we have organs starting to be removed and and perhaps destroyed or burned um, because religious movements change and the organ is no longer suited to that religious practice. Um, one, of these organ one of these stories um, relates to an organist, Tommy Tompkins. I always like to like, put myself in the place of some of these historical narratives. So he unfortunately um, was an organist when, the civil, um, when a civil war was breaking out in England and he had the unfortunate occurrence of having constitutionalists destroy his awesome giant organ um, that he would play for the king. And then be they beheaded his boss a year later. So he wrote a really sad song. Song, um, to kind of mourn that. <laughs> and meanwhile, organs are expanding and becoming more decorative and, and beautiful. They're, they're really um, architecturally uh, interlinked with the spaces in which they live. So organs have now spread throughout Europe, right? But they're also being exported all over the world. Um, organs are used um, are part of the uh, are used as a colonial tool and an imperialist um, sort of instrument. So they are being um, exported to Latin America and later even India. Um, which is uh, which is part of the sort of problematism of this of this giant machine, um, but as it gets exported, it also makes its way to North America. So this is the first, um, or what's considered the first organ to make its way here. Um, American organs were largely made in the um, the English style, so they were rather small to begin with. And in Vermont, um, they really kicked off around the 1800s. So this is a map. Of, um, of organs that I actually uh, made. We've got about 380 surviving in Vermont according to the Organ Historical Society database, which is also a little um, ramshackle, but <laughs> so there are definitely some flaws in this. Um, 
But uh, these organs um, have survived largely intact for, for a good amount of time. Um, we have organs from Hook and Hastings and Esty, who were big builders in the 1800s. And actually, there's an organ I play on this map. If I can navigate. Ah. All right, there we are. That's my little 1879 nine rank uh, congregational Hook and Hastings. <laughs> Um, and so we, we've got all these instruments, and uh, it's, it's a really cool facet of Vermont that I find not a lot of people actually are aware of. So it's an important thing to recognize. Not all of them are in churches. Great question. Uh, we have some in uh, meeting houses, and you know, at the time they, they would have also been built in opera houses, and they were really sewn into the fabric of um, musical and cultural life of the time. And with that, um, we can actually trace a little history of the organ in Vermont. So um, again, the oldest organ, organ was around 1800, probably some before that. Um, and then Hook and Hastings, which were based in Boston, started building in earnest um, in the 1830s. Um, then we have SD beginning to build reed organs, which everyone was super into. They were just like, reed organs are great. Um, so at their peak, they actually had the, these factories that manufactured 1,700 organs per month, which is a ton. Um, later, they got into pipe organs, and, um, and pipe organs sort of uh, production peaked around the 1920s. This is when you had organs installed in high schools and gyms and like pretty much anywhere you could think of. Um, unfortunately, this, this uh, huge popularity was, was short-lived because around 1930, um, both SD and Hook and Hastings ended up shuttering their, their doors. So um, SD made a little revival and got into electronic organs, um, but it was, it was very short-lived. These organs are beautiful. They're like pretty decorative. Um, at the time, both the churches and the organs would have been highly, um, highly ornamented. It was uh, not until the 20th century that a lot of the congregational churches around here were painted white. And the organ that I play was also painted white. It took a, a while to restore it. Okay, with that, um, I want to again reinforce that an organ is a marriage of acoustical space, um, instrument, player, and then audience. And some things start to change, right, once we get into the 20th century. Um, our acoustical space is changing. Churches are reconfiguring. Sometimes they're moving the organ halfway across the room. They're constructing little architectural details that muffle the sound, or they're carpeting their, these environments. The instruments have also been through the ringer in Vermont. They've had pipes removed or, um, or, or changed, or they've been electrified in some way. Um, and, and the audience, the tastes of the audience have also changed, and that has happened in a big way recently. So with that, I'm going to um, hit a little polarizing slide, um, which is to say... Um, did the pipe organ sell out? Is it still relevant? This is a question for many organists and many audience members right now. And it's something that I think we are all grappling with in the organ community. So we've seen a declining church, com church attendance. Um, certainly the nature of religion has changed a lot in this country and particularly in the state. Um, Maybe organs have changed during their, um, during their history, so they're, they're less connected to their original sort of design, and they're less engineered to the spaces that they inhabit. We see shifting aesthetics. People's favorite activity on a Saturday night is no longer to go home and sit around the reed organ and sing hymns, although I love doing that. Um, a lot of other people don't uh, necessarily consider it their cup of tea. Um, we also see uh, electrification of a lot of organs and the introduction of electronic organs, which I would argue uh, really changes um, the organ in a, in a big way, not necessarily a bad way, but, um, but it's, a, it's a big change. So this essentially place-based art is, um, is going through a lot, and I have no solutions, but I, I raise it as part of the story. A side effect of this is that we have less organists. 10% um, of the Vermont American Guild of Organists uh, is like under the age of, I 
think it's 35, <laughs> so <laughs> there are not a lot of us. And uh, this was notable enough to be written about in the New York Times in 1996. I can testify to some of these, uh, you know, juggling, juggling different jobs. Um, not going to speak to inadequate pay in case my pastor is listening. Um, we, uh, we never get to sleep in on Sunday or, uh, mornings. That's really the, the biggest uh, problem for me, in my opinion. <laughs> but, uh, but when you have less organists, so this, this, this organ, um, this instrument, this really complicated object is at a crossroads, and it's facing a lot right now, and, um, and there are a lot of questions about its direction in the future. So far, we've explored the artistic and cultural history of the organ. Um, I see a lot of organists in the audience, so thank you for putting up with that very like high-pass history. Um, but now I want to bring in some material history to look at some of the materials uh, that comprise the organ and help tell, um, help not only tell the story of the organ, but um, but see if we can dig into some of the issues facing it. So an organ's made up of a, an array of materials that you don't always find together. It's got metal pipes made out of lead, zinc, or tin alloys. Um, it's got wood comprising the case and also the pipes. Um, it's got ivory, plastic, and wood making up the keys, or ivory, pr plastic, or wood. And it's got leather and glue binding it all together. Here's an organ pipe that I made when I was in high school. Okay, <laughs> just wanted to do that. <laughs> um, so with all these materials, um, when organs reached the peak of their production and development, there was um, industrialization really became um, a prime factor in, in churning out this popular instrument. So with industrialization, we see a couple of side effects. There's, there's suddenly mass production of organs, um, such as SD in Brattleboro. Uh, there's also colonial effects related to the materials that are, that are comprising these organs. And there's a lot of anthropogenic impacts. Um, and I know, so this may seem not immediately interconnected, but if you can think of the organ as a machine that is made up of all these materials, um, we can start to look at the sources of those materials and how they have changed over time. So my home state, Missouri, is a major uh, source of lead mining. And since, since 1700s, there has been over um, 17 million tons of lead taken out of the ground. Um, it is, it, it's been um, pursuant to a, a lot of Superfund sites and environmental health problems in my state. Uh, there was also a big ivory trade, right? So in the year 1800, we had 26 million elef elephants, and now we're facing less than a million <laughs> in terms of population. And certainly organs and, and pianos were not the only factor for that decline, um, but they were certainly utilizing that material. And meanwhile, in a lot of parts of the United States, we were also facing deforestation, although in Vermont, um, I think primarily softwoods were being cut down. It's, it's still um, a, com a part of the history of these materials. So the organ perhaps stands as the archetypal anthropogenic mach machine of its time, right? It's, it's got all these stories to tell about its materials. And if we look at those through a scientific lens, um, ag again, we can, we can start to tell those stories better. As we, as we um, increase our understanding of materials and as the science of materials develops, we start to figure out that certain, um, certain materials that are in organs are very dangerous to humans. <laughs> so um, lead being a prime example, Europe accidentally banned the production of pipe organs in 2006 uh, with two directives that said you can't produce any electrified machines um, that have greater than 0.1% lead. This was a huge problem because the organ is a giant part of Europe's cultural history. <laughs> so... Um, unfortunately, this reflects a misunderstanding of science. So obviously lead is bad for us. Um, 
And why aren't we concerned about these giant lead monsters? The reason is that lead is pretty inert when it's in its metallic form. Um, there's actually a, th a thin like nanoscale layer of lead oxide that forms as a coating on the surface of the lead pipes. And unless you're shaving them down or like turning them into, into dust, it's not actually going to affect you. Um, although I do have questions about some organ builders. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, <laughs> And yeah, the actual bioavailability um, of lead is, is pretty low and it's in its metallic form. There's also problems with the ivory um, being present in a lot of our organs, especially in Vermont. Um, the organ I play has ivory in the keys. So um, as we try to save um, uh, increasingly endangered elephant populations, countries and states start to consider ivory bands. Um, this is an important uh, an important way to conserve this species. And in Vermont, um, this was brought to the Senate. And uh, considering our rich history of pipe organs, one would think maybe an organist would testify on whether this would impact um, our sort of cultural heritage surrounding those instru in instruments. Instead, uh, the drummer from Fish was, was brought in <laughs> to speak about it, which is fine. I mean, he knows a lot about music. Um, not, not questioning that, but, um, but he ended up obviously saying that it doesn't affect him at all, which is, which is definitely true. Um, <laughs> and this, is, this can, you might ask, why is this a problem for organs? Because they're so connected to their spaces, right? Are we, are we actually moving them? Um, and the answer is yes, with declining church attendance and reconfigurations um, of the musical sort of environments that fill those churches, organs are being sold, they are being transferred. I like to give my favorite organ donation uh, comic right here. Um, <laughs> And, and they're also being sold uh, pretty hastily through places like a global garage sale, like eBay, <laughs> eBay site that like promises to pick up your 1800s, like Jardine and Sons, like beautiful organ um, for free. So this is, this is a problem because if we can't sell organs um, or, you know, transfer them, then, then they become actually pretty endangered. Um, and I was talking to a, a forte piano conservator. So if, if none of you, if some of you don't know, forte piano is like a predecessor to the modern piano. Um, and he was really concerned about the future of ivory because he recycles um, ivory in older instruments and uses them and continues to make that ivory relevant um, and useful, which I think is important instead of just throwing it away. Um, but he was worried that there was no way to tell the difference between old ivory and new ivory, which, um, which is important because, again, we need to, we need to uh, keep the elephants from going extinct, obviously. Um, we don't want to sacrifice them to the temple of organs and forte pianos. Um, so I was thinking about this and did some research, and it turns out there's totally a way to, um, to solve this issue with radiocarbon dating. So um, we can actually date uh, the age of ivory within 10 or so years um, using this method, which has been, um, has been used by uh, a group to figure out the lag time between when ivory shipments make their way to countries um, that sell them and when those elephants are actually killed. So this was not actually something that someone thought of to apply to keyboard science, but the fact that this method exists means it's totally possible to apply this to a potential ivory ban. Maybe we can test the ivory and, and see how old it is before we consider um, you know, banning it um, or throwing it away. The only problem with this is that it is a destructive technique. So I brought this up to my forte piano friend, and he was super excited, and then he was super sad because he was like, what are you telling me? I have to, I have to like, take a small sample of this key and like, send it off. I'm not going to destroy my like, beautiful forte piano keys. So, alas. Um, the organ also starts to run into problems of, um, of actually... Uh, degradation. So um, there are a couple problems with the pipework, and um, they're related to the lead that comprises the pipes. So originally, 
pipes were made out of nearly pure lead um, during the organ's development, and this was prized for its beautiful musical sound. Um, in, in fact, C.B. Fisk, noted organ builder, he, he mentions that it has a darkness, a hollowness, and this phrase, I love this, an ability um, to flit about like a freshly hatched insect. That's, that's prime like, musical language right there. Um, and it's that beautiful color that gives the, the organ pipe its tone and its, and its, um, its beautiful sound. So when American organ builders were starting to build organs, they thought, okay, we'll just make organs um, with entirely pure lead pipes. Those pipes started sagging um, pretty quickly. So the, the lead at the top got a little thinner, and, um, and they actually started to deform. And this was because our current refinement processes allow us to get to like a 99.99999% um, lead purity. However, they didn't have like advanced or refinement processes back in the, in the 1700s. They were only to, able to get within 2%, and it's those trace amounts of metals like arsenic, copper, bismuth, and antimony that actually give organ pipes their structure and allow them um, to be cohesive and, and, um, and actually structurally intact. So that's pretty cool. My favorite uh, material organ story has to do with the actual eroding, corroding of organ pipes, which is a phenomenon that is recent. It's not an old phenomenon. Phenomenon um, in the 1900s, they started realizing that some of the most well-loved organs were developing um, gaping holes and um, this sort of encrusted material that was actually destroying the instrument. Um, and this was, a, this was a problem that was worked on by an awesome interdisciplinary group of musicologists and musicians and material scientists and chemists. They um, came up with several hypotheses for this, for this problem of corrosion. So it might be pollution, which has increased um, in the 20th century. It might be humidity and a changing climate. Or it might be a local culprit that lives right in the organ itself, which is wood. Um, I'll let you guess. <laughs> and what's really neat about this effort is they brought together, um, again, a, a team of interdisciplinary minds to work on this. They weren't um, just looking at it from a single angle. And that's what really allowed them to solve this, solve this problem. So. Um, a chemist who actually taught at my undergraduate um, school, Oberlin, uh, Catherine Ortel, she ended up um, studying the surface minerals on these organ pipes and came up with um, a diagnosis that lead carbonates were forming um, around the affected areas. So these lead carbonates include hydrocerocyte and cerocyte. Um, but she also found a couple other minerals, which included basic lead, lead acetate and lead formate um, and plumbonacrite. And these appeared to be sort of uh, transition um, minerals. So, so a fully sort of degraded organ would have a lot of hydrocerocyte and, and cerocyte, but in between, um, we might see some of these accessory minerals. And um, acetate and formate, so these are actually uh, salts of acids, right? So. So if we actually dig into um, the structure, we've got these lead oxide tetrahedra that are surrounded by, um, by these sort of acidic compounds. Why would we get acid in an organ? <laughs> the answer is wood. <laughs> didn't think it was that one. Um, so, so lead oxide usually forms, um, as I mentioned, a protective nanoscale thin um, layer on lead pipes themselves. But um, as wood actually dec decays, um, it releases uh, organic acids, such as uh, formic acid and acetic acid, into um, the air. And those acids then land on that on that protective barrier and end up interacting with moisture and carbon dioxide to erode and corrode the, the pipe itself. 
Um, so this is a real big problem for, for organs in Europe, and they're finding that it's a huge problem with, with organs that have had their, their wood replaced by wood with a high acidic content. So what's really awesome about this inter interdisciplinary group is since they were comprised of not just chemists and, um, and scientists, but they also had musicologists and instrument makers, they wanted to come up with solutions, and they found them. So uh, they came up with, an I with ideas that you could perhaps replace the, the high acidity wood with um, low acidity wood, such as oak, and you could also um, apply a nanoscale thick barrier of calcium oxide or magnesium oxide, which is basic, to sort of halt the, the interaction of those, um, those organic acids with the metal. Um, before I dive into some of the ways that um, that, mat that music can actually inform uh, the the world of scientific data, I want to make a brief foray and to talk about harpsichords because this is an awesome other uh, juncture of material science. So harpsichords also struggled with the same problem of um, of metal composition. Uh, I, well, as we've learned, um, certain ores that we were using in Europe. Um, uh, hundreds of years ago had higher phosphorus content than they, than they currently do, so that's been a really cool development. But with that, there's also been some awesome intersection of ornithology and like harpsichord building, which is my favorite story because um, there are also a lot of like pieces about birds written for the harpsichord, which is a little weird. <laughs> but... Um, so back in the day, uh, since a harpsichord, instead of like, so a piano, right, like uses a little mallet to hit the strings and an organ um, in, instead it forces wind through pipes, but a harpsichord uses a little plectra to pluck a string. And those plectra were actually made out of materials such as uh, like, like eagle feathers and crow and raven feathers back in the day. Um, this was an inspiration to modern harpsichord builders. Um, when harpsichords were sort of rediscovered in the early 1900s, they were made out of um, materials like metal and leather because people assumed they could make these instruments sound better than they, than they originally did. Later, we realized that metal was maybe not the most resonant and beautiful um, sound for like a, a giant harpsichord case. So we went back to wood and with it discovered that there were actually really cool material properties to bird quill. Um, it, there's a bit of a, a, a friction that's applied when you, when you pluck the string and there's also a slight um, change in, in the color of sound. So. If you're ever around the migratory um, route of Canadian geese and you see someone running around with a giant grin on their face picking up feathers, they just might be a harpsichord maker. <laughs> okay. All right, with that, um, I want to go on to, um, to look at some of the ways uh, that music can inform the way that we, that we visualize data and, and interact with some of these scientific concepts. So to do that, I'm going to take a piece of this, which is the corroding of organ pipes, and explore it from a deeper, from a scientific lens. Um, so I'm going to do some crystallography 101 for that. So here's a crystal, um, or this is a mineral comprised of a crystalline structure. And this is actually hydrocerocyte, which if you remember is sort of the last stage of organ pipe corrosion. Um, so it's a lead carbonate. and um, crystals are, or minerals are actually made up of a repeating, an ordered um, atomic structure, right? So, so this is the most reducible sort of uh, structure that you can visualize hydrocerocyte as. Um, uh, so, so as a crystal is, um, is growing, it forms this repeating structure. So this would be repeated many times in the actual mineral. Um, so, so here you've got lead ions visualized as dark gray. Um, the, the red is oxygen, and then the, um, those little light gray ones are, are car carbon atoms. How do we actually study these crystalline structures? The answer is x-rays. So we can use um, an x-ray diffraction um, technique to beam an x-ray at our sample, which then... Um, 
uh, is reflected off of different, differently oriented crystalline lattices and then collected on a photographic plate. Um, these patterns are incredibly gorgeous, in my opinion. Um, so here's a little sci art for you. Um, this is the result of those uh, reflected, collected x-rays. Um, so the brighter spots are where the x-ray has hit the, the photographic plate. There's another way to analyze um, these crystals through x-ray uh, techniques. That's um, by, by spinning sort of the x-ray and the sample around. Uh, you can change the way that those x-rays are directed. And when, when the x-rays reflect off and parallel, um, they're again collected by that x-ray detector. That produces, um, instead of um, a 3D visualization um, or a photographic pattern, um, it produces a 2D sort of representation of how that structure is defined. So this is the pattern, the mineral pattern of hydrocerocyte, the lead carbonate, remember? And we've got on the bottom axis um, the, the two theta, which is essentially a proxy for time when we're talking about the second technique. So our x-ray is spinning around the mineral, and, and as it moves, it's encountering differently oriented crystalline lattices, and, and it's, it's reflecting off and being collected. And when it's, where it's more intense, that x-ray um, has encountered uh, part of that lattice. So this essentially represents a mineral fingerprint of hydrocerocyte. I could take any, any sample of hydrocerocyte and it would spit out this pattern, which is really awesome. And you can use this as a diagnostic tool in forensics and geology and many other fields. I think it's the best. Um, but we can also look at this in a different way. So we've got the 3D representation of the molecule, uh, sorry, of the, of the crystalline structure. This is not hydrocerocyte, by the way. Um, we've also got the 2D representation. But if we've got 2D um, data, we can visualize that using sound. And since this is a story about, um, about organs and their sort of decomposition or their corrosion, I think it's really powerful to look at um, a mineral product um, on an organ in sound. And to do this, I've used time and um, as I've maintained time as time and used pitch uh, as my intensity factor. And pitch is a unitless variable in this case, so I feel comfortable doing that. <laughs> You'll see that I'm, I'm making choices by converting this into sound. Um. Right, so pitch being frequency. Um, it sounds a little boring because I coded this out in, in a synthesizer program, um, and I haven't learned enough of that coding language yet to make it like an interesting sound. <laughs> but if you think about it, this sound is actually pretty pretty suited to, to this project because it's a sustaining, almost sign tone like um, like sound, which is actually similar to the organ, which at its core is a sustaining continuous sound. So. Um, so I'm really excited about the potential for visualizing it this way. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, was it too soft? Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. It's a little disjunct. you'll notice that the sound of it um, was a little different than um, maybe the pattern appears. Um, my original sine wave was, was much more closely imitative of this, of this pattern. However, I wanted to fit it into um, a 10 note scale and I wanted, um, so to do that, I had to assign it to different parts of this to different notes. And the reason that I did this um, brings me to the project I've been working on here, this awesome maker space. Um, so I'm maker in residence for the months of March and April. And I wanted to tell a story of the organ's materials, and I wanted to do that um, through some of the uh, cool machines that we have here, including laser cutters and <clears throat> 
3D printers, et cetera. So I've been um, 3D printing the structures of some of these ma materials. I've also been um, making little cool like laser patterns um, of the actual 2D representations, so these guys. Um, but then I've been, I was, I was thinking about how best to sort of integrate my sound art. And at first I was like, well, I can just build an organ, right? That'll be easy, <laughs> like a small organ. <laughs> I got stuck on the keys. Everything's hard. I mean, so, so right now, I've been collaborating with a local harpsichord builder who has graciously allowed me with my clumsy, clumsy like fingers and terrible knowledge of woodworking. He's allowed me into his shop to kind of help with some things. And, and these are really complicated objects. You can't really um, half do an organ. You have to really do it right. So instead, um, I settled on building a little box of wind um, and I've got some pipes that, unfortunately, I bought off of eBay. I feel very guilty about it. I don't want to encourage the, like, the underground organ disassembling industry. Um, but I bought these, these little um, organ pipes, and, I can, I, I, and I've inserted them into the box, right, which, is, which has wind pumped into it. And then an Arduino controls some solenoids. This is no tracker, unfortunately. Um, an Arduino controls some solenoids and can actually play uh, the sound pattern of that hydrocerocyte mineral. So it's an <laughs> what's even better is these eBay pipes have a little thin coating of, of white mineralization, and I don't want to get my hopes up, but <laughs> it's a little too perfect. So an organ, it's a baby organ that is playing kind of the sound of its own demise. <laughs> And with that, I've really reached the goth period of my artistic <laughs> development. <laughs> um, but going on from there, I just want to really um, dig into this concept of visualizing data with sound. So, so often, um, as a teaching assistant, I would see um, people... Uh, interacting with data, having really magnificent data, and not really telling a story with it. I think sound has incredible potential to help us visualize data and communicate um, narratives with, with data. Um, and there's an example, actually, out of the Center for Investigative Reporting, um, reveal, they, they actually um, looked at earthquake data, of course, um, over 10 years that was coincident with um, the development of fracking. Um, let's see. Sorry. And um, there are a couple ways to visualize this. One is with, um, with a map. You can sort of see the frequency of these earthquakes happening over time. And you'll see that, that North... Um, Sorry, that Oklahoma starts pretty spiking around now um, in a big way. However, it's also kind of overshadowed by the developments in, in uh, California and some other areas. What if we look at this earthquake data with sound? Some of you may have already seen this, but I think it's pretty cool. Each one of these is an earthquake. So suddenly, we've got a really powerful visualization of the frequency with which um, earthquakes have increased in the past 10 years. 
We can also do this um, with other forms of art. So um, there's a group out of the, uh, the University of North Carolina that has actually looked at um, data visualization from a really um, artistic perspective, and they've done that with painting. So they've looked at weather data um, and said, OK, you know, looking at weather data can be really confusing. We have to put temperature on a graph. We have to put pressure on a different graph, wind speed, precipitation. And it gets really overwhelming. Um, it's hard to like look at a complex system um, using like dissociated, uh, using repeated sort of uh, graphs. So if we actually combine these um, and use a non-photorealistic visualization, which is the name that they call this technique, if we use brush strokes similar to an impressionistic painting, we can, <clears throat> we can actually incorporate all of these variables into one graph. So the, the top um, graph is showing uh, the weather um, in the, the winter, I believe, and the, the bottom is summer. And temperature is represented by the color, so the more blue, the colder it is. Pressure is represented by the size of the brush stroke. Wind speed is how closely um, they are clustered together. And then precipitation is whether the brush stroke is vertical or tilted. Suddenly, you can start to interpret this um, four variables, actually five if you include the spatial location, um, within a single graph, and that's really powerful. In the 10 years since they've done that work, they've moved on and, and made increasingly kind of beautiful graphs. This is more meteorological data, um, and it, you know, it ends up looking really, really beautiful in my mind. But we can also do that with sound. We've got a lot of um, variables at our di disposal um, with sound. So, so this is um, a little work I did in my, in my master's degree. I was leaching columns of lead-contaminated soil with acidic uh, rainwater. And um, as the columns were acidifying, I was studying the change in pH, how much lead was being solubilized, and um, a range of other factors. Once I use sound to visualize this data, um, since it's actually a continuous data set, I can, I can start to look at um, certain components together instead of getting a really clustered, overwhelming graph. So, so I'm going to play you a little piece. Um, the higher the pitches, the higher the lead concentration, and the higher the volume. <clears throat> The more, um, the more basic the pH. So what you are hearing is, um, as the column starts to acidify, the, um, the pH goes up, so it gets louder, and, and then the lead starts to be solubilized, so the pitch starts to go up. But near the end, um, as the pitch decrease, or as the volume decreases, the system has actually become um, acidified and is in equilibrium. So, I just think it's a, so it's really increasing the accessibility of our science, right? If we can have a visual component to our data, but also look at it from a sound perspective or interact with it physically, we can start to bridge understanding. Um, some people have a, a lot of imposter syndrome or, a, you know, a big um, sort of gut reaction to seeing information on, um, on a spreadsheet or, like, in, in a standard out-of-the-box graph. So if we, can, if we can use artistic methods to visualize data, we can do it more efficiently and more, effective, more effectively. With sound, we also have more variables um, at play. We have volume, we have pitch, uh, we have the duration, the length of sound. We have um, timbre, or whether it sounds like a saxophone or cello. And we can add multiple voices uh, to visualize multiple um, sets of data. So this is my um, sort of reckless idea. I think even though art science um, collaborations can be a really powerful way to communicate um, 
communicate science and tell a story, they can actually also help us understand complexity better. So moreover, this, like, this type of interdisciplinary lens can actually sh change how we see the world. So instead of um, an industrial age machine, um, we, can under we can understand the organ as more than a musical object. We can also understand it as a dynamic system of vibrating air, of, um, of elephant teeth, of complex mineral assemblages um, that changes in response to not just its, its physical environment, but also socio-cultural factors that are affecting it today. And with that, I will end on a light note. <laughs> So I've got this little melody that I've created, right, of a mineral, and it's kind of a horrible sounding melody, I will, I will say that. Um, but I'm a performing organist, and I, I would love to present this, um, this melody at the organ. And to do that, I think I'm going to use this, um, this uh, deep, deep learning um, model that has taken every corral that Bach ever wrote and trained on it such that if you give it a small melody, it will compose a Bachian corral, <laughs> which is probably going to sound pretty awful if I'm going to be honest, but I'm committed to retuning it enough to make it work. So thank you so much. Um, it's been really exciting to um, sort of form these, form these ideas, and I look forward to continuing art science collaboration in my future. So... Yeah. See, not a scientific person at all. Um, so, yeah, I had a general question about organ anatomy. Um, the uh, single pipe you have in front of you, I've seen single pipes uh, for sale in antique shops, and um, I've always been curious um, about the little wooden knobs on the end of the uh, pipes. Um, what are those? Do they have a name and a use? Wait, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Is that a good demonstration? <laughs> so wow. yes, you have found the tuning that the tuning um thing. I think it has a name actually. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> the tuning plunger. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I knew one of them was to blow into or to receive air, but uh, right, the other, and that's yeah. the foot exactly. The foot. This plugs into the, the yeah. wind chest. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I play every Sunday, <laughs> but I'm, um, I'm also performing um, in the future. I have a concert in Middlebury um, coming up on May 6th, actually, uh, in Mead Memorial Chapel. Um, so come to that. Yeah, it's, th it's at 3 p.m., um, and I'll be highlighting some, some composers that I find really compelling. So, yeah, I won't, I won't start to talk about them because then I won't stop, but... <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I they were copper, and they were done what they call flaming, where they heat them and they yeah, change yeah. colors. Mm -hmm. Was that strictly, I always thought it was just decorative. Does it have anything to do with changing the chemistry of the copper to make them more resistant? That's a really good question, and I have a feeling someone else at Generator would actually be able to answer that. Since I mostly study lead, I'm actually not totally... Um, familiar with the properties of, I mean, obviously co copper oxidizes really easily, so it may totally have something to do with that. I would, I would think it would, but um, yeah, that's hard to, hard to know so, for me. Um, good question. Mm -hmm. So uh, earlier, 
earlier you were talking about the some of the interesting historical like colonial and also mm -hmm. like environmental issues of the materials in there mm -hmm. uh, I had a couple questions uh, first off like the the uh, acidic surfaces uh, the acidic woods that we're talking about are those mostly mm -hmm. soft woods is that is that like a an American tradition or so like every every wood um, I guess has organic acids associated with it um, and those are like released as the wood breaks down it's just a matter of w which woods have more and which have less so a lot of hardwoods are used in the con construction of organs um, mm -hmm. but oak is a really good one because it has less than some of the other ones but yeah this is a, a problem that I was faced in Europe, by, but I imagine um, it's, it's also probably something to be on the watch for here. I'm, I haven't heard as much about this problem here. There's also like tin pest and some other nasty problems that organ pipes get. That <laughs> tin pest? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, tin pest is a difficult one. I'm trying to remember exactly it, the nature of is, that malady. Is it, a, is it an animal? Yeah, issue? basically. Okay. Yeah, it's little rats that live in tin pipes. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> no. Oh, so the, the the other question I had was like the the mm -hmm. environmental issues associated mm -hmm. with the materials. Uh, there was an argument for uh, for the the lead pipes as having a particular uh, mm -hmm. sound quality, mm -hmm. like a specific sound quality that was preferable I'm guessing to the uh, to the, the tin that you were talking about and also the mm. uh, the zinc right so lead has like less overtones than those other metals um, so it sounds a bit rounder and a bit more sort of like pure I guess if you can mm -hmm. think of us mm -hmm. so is, is that is that something that uh, was sort of arrived at historically or, um, mm. or or is there like a wide distribution as to like whether pipes are going to be made out of uh, lead as opposed to these other metals or alloys? So I don't know for sure, but I have a feeling that it probably took a short amount of time to settle on lead because not only does it have a great sound, it's also very easy to work. Mm -hmm. So um, so some other metals, um, yeah, so they might have tried lead because of it, it being so easy to work and then also realized that, yeah, it sounds a lot nicer than some of these other, these other metals. So it sounds mm -hmm. like lead mm -hmm. is something that people would continue to make uh, mm -hmm. pipes out of, um, right. assuming easy. availability, in, in a way mm -hmm. that ivory wouldn't, because it doesn't necessarily alter the, the sound or the performance in the same way. Right, exactly. Yeah, we can totally do without ivory in organs. Um, it's just, the, the problem is that ivory remains in a lot of the older organs, and replacing it is um, often out of, out of scope for a lot of churches and, and pretty costly. Um, yeah. And in, in mm -hmm. certain circumstances, I'm guessing not necessary. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm hoping some of the techniques that we, that we have at our disposal um, in the science world can, can help make that a possibility. And, and keep new ivory out. Yeah, yeah, no new ivory. I'm against it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hi, Mark. I'm aware of, of uh, I'm, a, I'm an organist, I'm aware of um, <laughs> the pipe organ. This is so enlightening because I'm aware of the pipe organ as a dynamic, um, whether it's because of decay or mellowing or however you want to talk about it, but over centuries, right. um, an instrument like that changes its sound, changes its chemical structure, whatever. And I'm wondering, it, it might be too soon technologically to know this, but I'm wondering mm -hmm. if modern analogs to the pipe organ, you know, digital instruments, if we could project into the future that at some point they will be shown to have mellowed. <laughs> I have That's no a idea. really awesome point. And actually, I feel like I have a little insight on this from my my beginnings as an organist. So I played in this this little garden chapel when I was 15 because the resident organist unfortunately had passed on and they didn't have any money to pay an organist. So they said, maybe we can get this this 15-year-old to play for free and just not tell her that organists are usually paid money. Um, <laughs> You know, I can, actually, no, maybe I was 13, but this is my entire, like, high school, right? I never got a Sunday to sleep in. This is pretty awful. Um, but I played this Wurlitzer, um, an electronic Wurlitzer organ that was not well ma maintained in any shape or form. Um, so it actually burbled. It, like, made these, like, kind of gurgling noises as the, t the dust settled. 
<laughs> and, which I think was because um, its connections had been like maybe mouse eaten a little bit and like various other environmental factors were at play. But it was really interesting because it forced me to use my ear in like a really big way. Um, so I'm not sure that, that electronic organs sound as great into the future as, as trackers do, but maybe they do. Definitely changes the character. Jenny. Um, so my question kind of revolves around like the history of organs with kind of its roots in colonialism mm -hmm. and this environmental factor of Union Ivory. Like how is that for you, like with your with your relationship with organs and your love for organs, um, mm -hmm. but also uh, and the preservation of organs with like this history behind it too. Right. Yeah. I think with any sort of art, you have to grapple with. Um, with the history and um, and sort of the different meanings that have been associated with it. I find this a lot when I consume art. Um, and with an instrument that has 2,000 years of history behind it, it's like, it kind of covers everything, right? So, so yeah, as a, as a person who studies the health effects of lead in soil, um, yeah, it's obviously kind of funny to, to play instruments that are made almost entirely of lead. Um, and then also as someone who has like, yeah, deep um, commitment to justice and, um, and anti-imperialism, that's also something I think about. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's a really long conversation that I've been like definitely having in my head and with others. <laughs> and, and I want to talk more about it. At the moment, um, I'm making my own meaning at the organ in a way that is both acknowledging that deep history and engaging with it. And, um, and I guess just like tell, trying to tell this story so, so that people know about this history. Because I, I think like with stuff like colonialism, um, with those legacies, we, we actually have to initiate that conversation and, and talk about the material sort of effects and um, the complex like, yeah, socio and cultural uh, dynamics at play to really start to... Um, I don't know, like remediate or not, but, but to think about those issues better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was pretty wandering. <laughs> Good question. One last question. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.